Um, I'm Matt Jarvis. I'm Director of Developer Relations at a company called Sneak. And I'm joined by my glamorous assistant, <laughs> fabulous co-host, um, who many of you will be familiar with, um, Andrew Martin, who's the CEO of Control Plane. So, um, at some point in the 2010s, I was sat in this uh, semi-derelict data center on my own, um, bootstrapping an OpenStack public cloud. And uh, Andy was in the rather more salubrious environment of the UK government's offices in, uh, in Marsham Street in London. But we were both working on kind of similar things on how to build and operate on-prem uh, private clouds, primarily uh, using OpenStack. And there was no Kubernetes, there was no Docker, um, but you know, the practices were pretty good for the time. Um, good DevOps principles, everything in code, orchestration using things like Puppet, but there was still lots of brittle bash scripts that needed regular tending. And the experience of managing security back then was very different. Um, there was lots of manual work, uh, scanning stuff using tools like Nessus, um, custom vulnerability checks in Nagios, and pretty limited tooling for automation. And the point of all of this is that um, the cycle of technology change moves pretty fast, and it's only getting faster. And the difference in the next decade is likely to be significantly bigger than in the last one. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, a few things that could change the way we think about and manage security um, even more dramatically over, over the next 10 years. Um, at this point, huge disclaimer, um, none of this is in any way a prediction um, or investment advice. Um, history is littered with examples that most things in technology uh, rarely go in the direction uh, we think they're going to. This is over to you, sir. And with that, let's start by looking at a history of cloud native, how we've developed, where we've come from, and where indeed we may go. So we started with mainframes, moved through co-located rental servers, and then virtual machines opened up the cloud. So where did cloud native come from? Let's see if we can get refocused on this. There we go. We have Linux birthing LXC, the first container runtime out of Ubuntu. Google contemporaneously built Borg, the distributed container manager. Containers, but not as we know them today. And the Linux kernel ships KVM, the kernel virtual machine, which runs software virtualization based on the paradigms that Zen, of Zen that were then built out into AWS and leveraged to instigate large-scale public cloud. Those resilience and scaling lessons that we learned from cloud usage inspired the working patterns and practices that have become cloud native today. And from there, the technology exploded, Docker, Kubernetes, OCI, the birth of next generation hybrid runtimes mixing containers and VMs, such as Kata containers, Gvisor, Firecracker. These foundational technologies birthed public cloud and brought us somebody else's computer. So those lessons that we learned, scalability, elasticity, resilience to underlying machine failure, these helped us to commoditize distributed systems. Containers arrived to split the kernel into individual buckets of compute, each container a microcosm of Linux, running on a shared kernel for resource sharing. Containers do not even exist. There is no struct for them in the kernel, and this is why Docker grew to such rapid success, a user-friendly wrapper around the deep Linux complexity of container implementation which didn't support cross-host networking, data sharing, service discovery, or any of the other differentiators that brought us the good ship Kubernetes. So we rocked on with Kubernetes for a while until people started to question if containers were better than VMs after all. Surely we could take the hardware-assisted isolation of virtual machines and the lightweight container security barriers and merge them together. Welcome to the next generation of runtimes, micro VMs, various different forms of isolation. And the container image formats remained compatible. Containers on a rainbow fired trajectory into the stratosphere. 
But this isn't the classic high-level white-collar trend talk. This is what's coming through the CNCF's next zero to five years worth of project and industry trends. We touch some of these technologies on a daily basis so you don't have to. So, next generation process isolation. Software abstractions require CPU time to execute, and so virtualization is a balance of security and performance. We have server-side WebAssembly. Tooling is now starting to proliferate after Docker's alpha driver for container D. WebAssembly is a binary format for executable code. As I say, Docker and container D now support this. It's already maintained with in-browser virtual implementations for 40 or so languages, including C++, Golang, and Rust, and everything can be transpiled straight down into a binary format. However, server-side WASM is unlikely to replace containers entirely this year due to its core and some of the file system APIs being under active development and the lack of de developer friendliness, which is actually starting to be changed by companies such as Fermion and their spin platform. Unikernels, different view on the same story. We've tried this before. A lack of debuggability and introspection makes them very difficult to use. Approaches are still being investigated, but generally this involves repackaging, which is a developer hostile step. And we don't expect this to proliferate anytime soon and Kata containers, arguably the most mature project in the hybrid container VM space, will start to be put through more hardcore production use cases, things that require high IO and challenge some of the layers of abstraction and indirection. Kata has pluggable runtimes, so it can be used with Firecracker, QMU, Cloud Hypervisor, and is working to build what will become the standard implementation of lightweight virtual machines. Um, so, whatever packaging and isolating technologies we end up using, uh, that's really just part of the security puzzle that uh, we need to solve when we, when we create modern software. Um, what most of the emerging trends in security uh, are doing is building chains of trust. And the reality of any chain of trust is there has to be something at the bottom that we can actually trust. And it's obviously very important that we trust our build systems, the things that produce our artifacts. And there's a couple of different dimensions here. Um, the first being, uh, can we trust our build to always produce the same thing? Um, now, this might be non-obvious to, to some folks, but there's not necessarily any guarantee that the thing you're building is exactly the same every time you build it. And if it's not exactly the same, then you can't really guarantee its validity. Um, even slight differences may introduce unexpected behavior or potentially uh, security vulnerabilities. And this could happen if you're using uh, timestamps, if your ordering is volatile, and for a whole host of, of other reasons. So how can we ensure our builds are completely deterministic? Well, this um, reproducible builds concept has been around for a long time, and that aims to do exactly that. It's a set of uh, software development practices that's aimed at creating bit-for-bit -bit identical artifacts every time we run our build process. And lots of large open source projects already practice this. But again, we kind of hit this issue of what can we trust? Um, if we use pre-built binaries in our build pipeline, um, can we know that those binaries aren't compromised? And with that in mind, some folks are starting to talk not only about reproducible, but also bootstrappable builds, where our entire build chain, our entire build pipeline is also built and can be verified. So before we build, um, we build the thing we use to build, but you know, where, do, where does that stop? Um, can we trust pre-built operating systems? And there's a, a train of thought that even the smallest general purpose operating system is now too big to be auditable and verifiable um, by a human. And there's lots of interesting work happening in this space with um, projects trying to build the smallest thing that can boot hardware and build compilers, which then can be used to build other things and so on. And these are generally written in very low-level languages um, with the aim of being human auditable. So at least some programmers, um, you know, clearly low-level languages is a, a, a very specific kind of programmer is, is working in these, uh, these low-level languages. But at least some programmers can be capable of reading and understanding that entire code base. And we're talking really, really, really tiny here in the order of, of hundreds of bytes. 
Um, but now we're really off down the rabbit hole of, of finding something somewhere that we can ultimately trust. Even if we can boot our hardware with something uh, really tiny that we can fully audit, um, can we actually trust the hardware? Now, you might say at this point, uh, no one cares about hardware anymore. We're all in the cloud, right? But as Andy pointed out earlier, the cloud is still and always will be just uh, somebody else's computers. And the world of silicon is notoriously proprietary. Uh, there's lots of proprietary features in modern chipsets that you may never know about. Um, in the hardware space, we're operating almost entirely on trust. Um, and this is not just the chips themselves, this is all the tooling to design them, build them, is also in general proprietary and unavailable for us to, to verify. And this is one of the things that's driving the creation of open source silicon. And there's lots of open, interesting projects happening in, in this space from uh, things like Open Risk, uh, which has the aim of creating a fully fledged open source processor, uh, to more specifically security focused projects like Open Titan, um, who are building an open source design for root of trust chips uh, for validating hardware and software when we, when we boot machines. And these projects are all about. Um, having those designs available for folks to verify and, and to audit. And there's an argument to be made that um, computer architectures have remained relatively unchanged for uh, more than 30 years. Um, a lot of the, the conceptual things, virtual memory, multitasking, operating systems, paging, um, we've got, they've got smaller, they've got more powerful, but fundamentally a lot of the things about how the CPU works are fairly similar. And because of that, we're still using a lot of the same paradigms in programming. And these architectures have features that could be considered uh, contributory to certain classes of security vulnerability, uh, particularly around memory safety. So are there changes in computer architecture which can help us to reduce the attack surface? Well, there's a team at the University of Cambridge in the UK who've been developing a new instruction set, um, CHERRY, an acronym for Capability Hardware Enhanced Risk Instructions. And this is designed specifically to mitigate uh, software security vulnerabilities. And the way CHERRY works is by introducing a new set of processor primitives, um, which provide a mechanism for uh, fine-grained memory safety and process isolation, but directly in the hardware. So it's a combination of tool chain support as well and hardware to reduce the amount of vulnerabilities that attackers can exploit. So the idea of least privilege, but highly efficient, highly scalable, because it's done directly in the CPU. And Cherry is a concept that's been around since about 2010, but there's now hardware that actually supports it in the form of this ARM Morello board. And there's lots of development uh, going on to widen the ecosystem of, of software support for this new architecture. Right, so let's move up from the hardware into the runtime and look at the kernel and see how we expect Linux to develop. First of all, we have Rust a programming language that has been gaining in popularity due to its focus on memory safety and performance. Despite scant initial support for Rust in the Linux kernel, the inclusion of a recent device driver written in Rust is a significant step forward towards a new era for the kernel, starting to assuage the risk of memory safety bugs and bringing in memory management in a way that the kernel has done natively before. Rust's place as a memory-managed, low-level systems language distinguishes it, as long as unsafe mode isn't used to bypass some of those compile time guarantees, and its developer community expects to see more Rust modules turning up in the kernel in the future. Those skeptical of Rust's claims to kernel contribution have quietened, and the kernel refuses to break backwards compatibility. So now that we have the device driver in Rust, in order for that to be removed from the kernel, it would have to be backported or reported into another language. This is the inertial start of a change that may take many years to come to effective fruition, but in terms of security benefits, heralds a new era for memory safety in the Linux kernel, eBPF. So hot right now, a technology increasingly used in recent years to enhance the performance, security, and observability of various Linux-based systems. 
This technology allows for the creation of in-kernel programs that can be used for a wide variety of functionalities such as packet filtering, system call tracing, and security enforcement. One of the most notable features of eBPF is the Express Data Path XDP program. This is high-speed packet processing which can be offloaded to a smart network card for acceleration. You can drop packets before they even hit the kernel. Additionally, ongoing work in the kernel runtime security instrumentation eBPF Linux security module closes the gap between asynchronous observability and synchronous enforcement by executing these code, uh, this code in a synchronous blocking LSM. Providing a consistent interface for security enforcement makes it possible for some of the new CNCF security projects to leverage eBPF to enhance application security, obviating the need for consumers to write BPF code itself. While BPF has many advantages, we're also seeing a kernel TLS offload, which means that running code on a shared kernel can expose things like perfect forward secrecy tokens to a shared eBPF runtime. So as with any technology, there are always compromises that affect how we deploy and architect our systems and our applications. There are two Linux capability requirements for BPF, CAP BPF and CAP Perfmon. Most of the container breakouts that we've seen over the past few years have required these elevated privileges. So again, there is a balance between commoditizing and making things safer for adoption. But hiding the contents of memory, execution and disk from a hostile user is difficult and is the paraphrase of confidential computing. This requires, as we've been talking about, trust, supply chain security all the way back through the hardware and microcode that is used to run these platforms. But organizations have existing deep levels of trust with, for example, their cloud vendor. And we're seeing things like AWS Nitro able to support things we never thought we'd see in the cloud, such as um, quant and hedge fund secret source algorithms being run on shared public compute because of the isolation and secrecy guarantees with these platforms. Long-term goals such as homomorphic encryption, where data is processed in an encrypted state, are also being researched. However, these technologies are nascent and in an early stage, which makes them reasonably impractical due to limitations in the instruction sets and slower execution and longer processing times due to that overhead of encrypted processing complexity. A concrete use case from uh, the OG Kubernetes product owner, David Aronchik, Web3 bringing the promise of compute over data. This is running trusted workloads on untrusted nodes. So if we have a shared data set, but we want to mutate parts of it on a distributed system like the internet, how do we achieve that? This is the, uh, the most useful high scale concrete computing use case at the moment. Um, so you're going to hear a lot about keys, about signing and about certificates this year. Um, it's a fairly safe prediction that uh, artifact signing in our software development lifecycle becomes pretty much standard. And uh, public key cryptography served us well for 30 years plus. It's underpinned all the innovation in the uh, web and internet spaces. But there, there might be problems in cryptography um, approaching. Uh, this is a quantum computer. And quantum computers not only look cool, but they work very differently to, to classical computers, uh, replacing the concept of, of bits, zeros and ones, with quantum bits or qubits uh, based on the properties of quantum mechanics. And unless you're a quantum physicist, um, most of quantum mechanics is completely mind-bending for uh, normal humans. Um, but most folks might be familiar with the uh, concept of Schrodinger's cat uh, thought experiment about a hypothetical cat that's both alive and dead at the same time, uh, whilst in a sealed box with a fatal radioactive element. And this rather macabre example illustrates how particles can be zero or one or both. And it's that superposition phenomenon that quantum computers are based on. And they are theoretically very good at certain classes of problems that are very hard for classical computers. And factorization of prime numbers is, is one of these. Uh, this is a visualization of Shaw's algorithm uh, developed in the 1990s by mathematician Peter Shaw. And this is widely viewed as a proof that quantum computers could potentially break public key cryptography, including uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchanges and um, algorithms like RSA. And this might be theoretical, but uh, 
A lot of researchers believe it could happen in the next decade on a day uh, known as Q-Day, when most of our crypto would be broken, all our certificates become vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks, um, and all our encryptions cracked. And there's a lot of different actors involved in building quantum computers, including uh, lots of three-letter agencies and nation-states, so we might never even know uh, that this has happened. And it's serious enough for governments to take action um, with a move towards new kinds of algorithms um, more resistant to, to quantum computing. This is known as post-quantum cryptography. And in the US, NIST has been uh, running this competition for the last few years, and the algorithms were actually selected in 2022. Uh, they've all got pretty cool names. Um, any algorithm with a Star Trek reference in it has got to be good. Um, and at some point, it's likely that uh, we'll all need to switch our keys, our certificates, and our infrastructure over to these new methods. Um, um, so we've talked about a bunch of stuff about crypto, about hardware, build systems, the kernel. Um, but the real elephant in the room is the rise of, of artificial intelligence and, and more specifically large language models. Um, now, unless you've been living under a stone, uh, you'll have seen a lot of traffic about ChatGPT uh, since it was released back in November. It's hard to believe that's only, uh, you know, a, a, a few short months ago. And uh, the growth in users has been unprecedented. Millions of people have been trying it out. GPT-4 has just been uh, released, which is uh, an order of magnitude more powerful. And if you've actually used it, um, it's clear pretty quickly that this technology is going to be uh, truly transformational for how we interact with computers. Um, entire industries are going to be uh, disrupted by these abilities to write complex text based on um, fairly limited human input. And pretty quickly after the release, people start to experiment with having ChatGPT write code. Um, and again, uh, results have been pretty extraordinary, uh, given relatively small inputs. Um, ChatGPT is already capable of writing uh, pretty much correct complex applications in multiple languages, uh, manipulating data between formats, translating programs from one programming language to another, and even writing programs in fictional programming languages. And um, it's clearly not about to displace uh, human programmers just yet, but you know, this field's moving incredibly quickly. Um, it, it's, it's already clear that this is going to drive uh, massive change, no matter what you, you, you might believe about, uh, about uh, this field in general. Um, I actually gave this talk, uh, um, uh, a version of this talk um, in Seattle uh, around uh, the start of this year. And uh, I had note here that they can't reach out to other systems on the internet, but there's already systems in place now to be able to do stuff like that. So uh, things have already changed pretty dramatically. Um, and a lot of researchers have been talking about the idea of conversational programming in general. So uh, this is that we would interact with models based on what output we need, not on how to achieve the result. And the, the model will get to that result by any means it deems appropriate. But this kind of raises some pretty fundamental questions about um, the future of application software. Um, if that future involves uh, large language models writing programs for us where we only care about the output, then the kind of question arises about why uh, computers would use high-level programming languages at all to get to that result. I mean, computers don't know anything about programming languages. Um, these are all languages are basically abstractions uh, to make it easier for human programmers to program computers. Everything's either interpreted or compiled down to something the computer can actually run. And uh, since such a huge proportion of our issues with, uh, with software supply chain at the minute come from how we assemble um, uh, software using packages and libraries, perhaps this, uh, this era of AI-generated programming will, uh, will solve that problem for us. So this gives birth to a, a new form of job, prompt engineering, attempting to trick the machine into giving us the answer that we want. Uh, one thing we've missed off this slide is if you haven't played with jailbreak GPT yet, you can bypass all the controls because everything is just a prompt on top of the language model itself. And this will lead us into an interesting new space where new jobs are created, machines will provide us with an embellishment or an augmentation to our workflow rather than a full replacement, but then we will see classes of jobs at risk. How long will it be before AI eats our collective breakfasts? Ideally, a little bit further. So perhaps we'll see things like integrated application security platforms, supply chain to runtime integration and attestation, 
personal user security, which may require access and indexing of all your data, whatever form that takes. You be the judge of whether it is sensible to cede control of those things to an unproven model. How long might it be? Well, let's look at DeepMind to get an idea of the timeline. Looking at the arc by which the organization developed features, we see rapid exponential growth. We're at the leading edge of the curve for public AI use cases. And of course, we'll see innovation and adoption dramatically accelerate. So what will that look like? Automated attack simulation has been growing in popularity since DARPA's 2016 Cyber Grand Challenge, which was a, comp a competition for automated binary, and ana binary analysis and exploitation. We also see things like deepfakes infect the information landscape, China passing laws requiring watermarking of AI-generated content, universities and organizations banning the use of AI-assisted writing, but the greater threat is probably as yet unrealized. AI tooling that is able to effectively iterate through implants or generate novel exploit code and chain those things together in new and unusual ways may wreak havoc on our systems and our defensive models and require greater defensive capabilities. So moving forward, the spiritual or literal successes to ChatGPT are expected to be able to generate weaponized payloads for existing and novel vulnerabilities and eventually novel to human approaches to exploitation. Therefore, automated remediation is a potential foil to the harbinger of AI doom. Attackers need to only find a single entry point to our system, while defenders must protect all aspects. Uh, attackers think in graphs, defenders think in lists. So defenders can proactively probe their own defenses with the same automation that attackers are using. And automated remediation may do things such as isolate breached workloads, black holing compromised routes, and revoking compromised key material. My colleague Francesco is talking with uh, Matt Turner from Tetrate on automated cloud native incident response with Kubernetes and Service Mesh to explore some of these ideas further in the security and identity room at 11.55. There is one extra element here, which is false negatives or remediation from a security perspective, remediative actions that take availability of a system down and result in production downtime is a potential issue that will see a slow and measured adoption of these potential technologies. But AI systems make this a potentially viable approach in future. Uh, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think what we're saying is that it's going to be massively impactful across the security landscape. Um, and potentially for the way we write applications and the way we uh, attack and, and defend them. Um, and ultimately, we're still back to our starting point about trust. Um, can we trust our AI model? And more importantly, is it plotting a, a robot takeover of the human race? Um, and I think our general point in this talk is that the security landscape is likely to become much more complex than it's ever been in the past. And the technical challenges of some of these emerging threats are going to be much more difficult to solve. Um, it'll become imperative that uh, together as an industry, we rethink how we educate and train um, the next generation of developers, of, of systems, uh, systems folks and security practitioners uh, to meet these challenges. And, you know, I know Andy and I are both involved in some of these efforts from, from bodies like the Linux Foundation and, and uh, running things like CTFs and, and that kind of stuff. Um, there is obviously no such thing as secure software in most cases. Um, you know, the reality of the world that we live in is the friction between uh, velocity being the key driver for, for business success, how, how fast we can get uh, our products to users and understand the data coming back from those users um, versus the increasing complexity of security issues um, is it, it's a, a, a circle that can't, the, the, a square that can't uh, be a circle, right? It's not easily overcome. And this is a, a fragile balance that, uh, that may not survive contact with uh, the ever more complex vulnerabilities and, and automated uh, adversaries. Um, so to return to the disclaimer, um, some or all of this talk is, is very likely to not come true. Um, predictions are notoriously difficult in technology. And uh, yeah, that was me 30 years ago, uh, so what do I know? Um, but um, we'd like to leave you with a quote from that uh, eminent futurologist, uh, Dr. Emmett Brown. Uh, your future is whatever you make it, so make it a good one. Thank you. <laughs>